Of all the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve in the entire world of Narnia, there is one character whose popularity has surged over the last decade above all others. He's been called a dark horse, and his transformation in the world of Narnia has left a mark not only on his own life, but on the history of Narnia itself. I'm talking, of course, about Edmund Pevensey, otherwise known as King Edmund the Just. And today, we're gonna to talk about the life of Edmund Pevensey, stopping along the way to point out the major events during his time in Narnia. But before we get started, I wanted to take a minute to tell you about the amazing classical Christian resources that I've discovered from my friends over at Memoria Press. Now, I'm a big fan of the rich curriculum they produce for K through 12 classical Christian schools and homeschoolers, especially the literature guides for The Magician's Nephew and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Every page of the Memoria Press curriculum leads students to a mastery of content and an appreciation of goodness, truth, and beauty. If you're interested in learning more, visit them at memoriapress.com slash wardrobe. And as always, I wanna offer a huge thanks to all my supporters on Patreon. Without your help, I wouldn't be able to produce these videos, so thank you very much. Well, there's a lot to cover today, so let's get started. It's time to leave the Shadowlands behind and step into a world that's more real than our own. It's time to follow me into the wardrobe. Edmund Pevensey was born in the city of London in 1930 as the third of four siblings. His oldest brother was Peter, who was three years his elder, and his oldest sister Susan was also two years older. He had a younger sister, Lucy, who was one year younger than Edmund. While Edmund grew up getting along well with his siblings, something changed after attending boarding school at Hendon House. And for several years, Edmund generally developed a miserably spiteful attitude towards his brothers and sisters, who in turn returned the sentiment. In the late summer of 1940, when Edmund was 10 years old, the German Luftwaffe began a merciless bombing of London, infamously known as the Blitz. Edmund and his siblings were evacuated to a large countryside mansion, home to Professor Diggory Kirk. It was during their time in the mansion that the children discovered the magical wardrobe, which would serve as a portal into the fantastic world of Narnia. While Lucy was the first to discover Narnia, Edmund had secretly entered the world one day while searching for Lucy in a game of hide and seek. While Edmund was exploring the snowy world, he accidentally stumbled into the path of the false queen of Narnia, Jadis the White Witch, who had ruled the land of Narnia for nearly a century and cast the whole country into an eternal icy enchantment where it was always winter and never Christmas. In a cunning move, Jadis offered Edmund a warm drink and any kind of food he'd like. Upon request, she conjured up a plate of fine Turkish delight, which Edmund eagerly consumed. Little did he know that the food had been enchanted and caused a nearly irresistible addiction to anyone who ate it. When Edmund asked for more, Jadis told him that he must first return to his world and bring his brothers and sisters to her at the castle, where she would not only give him all the Turkish delight he could ever want, but also make him a prince and an heir to the throne and make his siblings Edmund's personal servants. Edmund returned to his world, and a few days later, all four children once again stumbled through the wardrobe into Narnia. Immediately, Edmund thought of the Turkish delight and remembered the orders that he was given by Jadis. That night, while the children were enjoying a meal in the lodge of Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, Edmund secretly slipped away and headed directly to the castle of the witch. Once there, Edmund was surprised to discover that Jadis wasn't delighted to see him, but instead she was enraged that he had dared to come to her without his brothers and sisters. However, Edmund provided Jadis with information on where to find them. Jadis' rage turned to panic when Edmund informed her that Mr. Beaver had claimed that Aslan had already returned to Narnia, and the children were headed to meet him at the Hill of the Stone Table. Immediately, Jada sent her secret police, led by the great wolf Mogram, to find them. And instead of rewarding Edmund for betraying his siblings, Jadis ordered him to be bound up and taken to her sled, where he would depart with Jadis and the dwarf immediately to the stone table. Within a matter of hours after departing, the world of snow and ice began to thaw, a sure sign to Jadis that Aslan had indeed returned. With the sled stuck in the muddy ground, Edmund was forced to walk on foot until Jadis finally decided on a new plan. She would kill Edmund immediately in order to prevent the prophecy from becoming fulfilled. 
with Edmund bound to a tree and a sharpened knife in Jada's hand. She prepared to deliver a death blow. However, before she got the chance, a rescue party sent by Aslan arrived and freed Edmund from his captivity. Jadis escaped with the help of magical invisibility, and Edmund was brought by the party to meet Aslan at the encampment at Baruna. After a long and private talk with Aslan, Edmund apologized to his siblings for his betrayal, and Aslan deemed the matter finished. However, the next day, Jadis arrived at Aslan's camp and demanded Edmund's return. She revealed that because Edmund was a traitor, he was her lawful prey according to the laws of deep magic and justice demanded that Edmund be sacrificed on the stone table. Now Aslan could not deny Jadis this right. However, in a private meeting, he arranged a secret deal with Jadis. Edmund would be set free, and instead Aslan would take his place on the stone table, willingly offering himself as the sacrifice in Edmund's place. Jadis happily agreed, and that night, unbeknownst to Edmund and the others, Aslan was sacrificed by Jadis on the stone table. With Aslan dead, Jadis and her army attacked the Narnian army the following morning at the first battle of Baruna. Edmund joined with the other Narnians and fought valiantly. He boldly pressed into battle. He killed three ogres as he made his way toward the White Witch, who had been devastating the Narnian army by using her wand to turn her opponents to stone. And then, in one of the most significant moments in the battle at Baruna, Edmund fought his way to Jadis, and in a decisive blow of his sword, he knocked the wand from her hand, destroying it and putting an end to her stone casting spells. And at that very moment, Edmund witnessed a resurrected Aslan who brought down Jadis, killing her and putting an end to her 100 year reign of terror. However, in the battle, Edmund had been mortally wounded. He would have died if not for Lucy's magical healing cordial, which saved his life that day along with many others. Because of his bravery on the battlefield, that very day, Aslan decreed Edmund a Knight of the Noble Order of the Table. Three days later, Edmund and his siblings stood in the Great Hall of Caer Paravel, where Aslan crowned them kings and queens of Narnia. They took their thrones in that great palace, thus fulfilling the ancient Golden Age prophecy. All of this took place in the Narnian year 1000. Now Edmund reigned in Narnia for 15 years, during which time he would become known as King Edmund the Just, no doubt after experiencing firsthand the true and deeper meaning of justice from Aslan himself. Now during his reign, Edmund helped return Narnia to its former glory, fighting in the Narnian army as they rid the country of giants, sailing the Eastern Ocean on the great ship, the Splendor Hylene, and visiting the long neglected islands of the Narnian Empire establishing an alliance with the neighboring kingdom of Arkenland, and opening domestic channels with the southern country of Kalerman. In the year NT 1014, while King Peter was leading a raid on the northern giants, King Edmund and Queen Susan embarked on a diplomatic journey aboard the Splendor Hylene, while Queen Lucy stayed behind to govern the kingdom. Edmund and Susan were bound for the capital city of Tashbon, where they intended to sign a treaty. While there, they discovered that the Kalerman Prince Rabadash intended to take Susan as his wife, whether by will or by force. They devised a cunning escape and sailed immediately home to Caer Paravel. When they arrived back home, they learned from a messenger stag that Prince Rabadash was furious and had organized an army to march across the great desert and overtake Arkenland. Once Arkenland was captured, Narnia would be next. King Edmund summoned his Narnian army, and he and Queen Lucy marched to Arkenland to meet the Kalerman invaders head on. After a hard fought battle, the Kalermans were defeated, and once again, King Edmund had proven his worth in a decisive victory for the kingdom of Narnia. In less than a year's time, all four kings and queens of Narnia were united together at their home in Caer Paravel. Under their rule, Narnia had been brought to such a time of peace and prosperity that the monarchs allowed themselves some free time. The four royals decided to go on an excursion to see if they could capture a magical white stag that had been recently spotted and reported by Mr. Tumnus. As Edmund and the others chased the animal through the forest of Lantern Waste, they came across a strange iron post planted in the ground that they vaguely remembered. They continued on through the thick woods, slowly remembering some of their old life, the life before they came to Narnia 15 years earlier. 
And as they drove further in, the trees began to soften, eventually becoming as soft as fur coats, until they all spilled out of the wardrobe door. No longer the grown adults they were in Narnia, they were now children as before, and it was still the Earth year, 1940. Edmund and his siblings had only been gone minutes in our world. Now, about a year later, in the early fall of 1941, Edmund and his siblings were waiting to board a train to take them all to boarding school, when another magical portal opened, pulling them all back into Narnia once again. The children soon discovered that this was not the Narnia they knew and loved, but an older Narnia. The forest had become overgrown and there were ruins where their beloved Care Paravel once stood. It was Edmund who realized now how this was possible, quite possibly becoming the first human to devise the interdimensional loose time theory, which states that interdimensional time from one world such as Narnia was not directly coupled with time from another world such as ours. A few days after their return to Narnia, the children rescued a red dwarf named Trumpkin who was about to be drowned by two Telmarine soldiers. Trumpkin explained that it was now the year 2303 NT, and Narnia had been overrun by the Telmarine humans, who had driven the creatures of Narnia into hiding under the reign of the current usurper of the throne, who called himself King Miraz. However, a Telmarine prince named Caspian X had rallied an army of true Narnians to fight their conquerors, and it was he who had blown Susan's horn to bring Edmund and the others back to Narnia. He needed their help, and they were told to rendezvous at Aslan's Howe, which was once known as the Hill of the Stone Table. The group departed at once for Aslan's Howe, and after a treacherous journey with many missteps, Aslan appeared to them and sent Edmund and Peter off on their own to join up with Caspian and his army. When the two arrived at the Howe, they discovered that there in the chambers, an assassination plot was afoot. Caspian was currently doing battle with a black dwarf, a werewolf, and a hag, and he was losing. Edmund and Peter jumped into action and killed all three attackers, saving the life of Caspian that day. After the attack, Edmund and Peter joined in a Narnian council meeting where they devised a plan to defeat the Telmarines in spite of the much smaller numbers of the Narnian army. Instead of launching a full-on attack, they would challenge Miraz to a duel, with High King Peter serving as the Narnian champion. Edmund was chosen to deliver the challenge to the king, who promptly accepted. Later that day, with Edmund and Caspian serving as witnesses, the duel was carried out. However, the fight was disrupted when Miraz was murdered by one of his own men, and a full-scale battle broke out, which would eventually become known as the Second Battle of Baruna. Edmund was one of the first to rush in, leading the battle cry, Narnia, Narnia, the lion! With the wholehearted fighting of the Narnian army and the sudden arrival of reinforcements from the awakened trees, the Narnian army drove back the Telmarines, who found themselves trapped at the river Baruna. With that, the Telmarine army surrendered. Caspian was knighted by King Peter that day, and the next day it was announced across the land that Caspian X was now the King of Narnia. Five days later, Aslan gathered Edmund and his siblings, as well as the remaining Telmarines, to a glade at the Fords of Baruna, where he had set up a large wooden gate that served as a portal back to our world. And so, after helping Caspian X restore peace to the Kingdom of Narnia, Edmund and his siblings passed through the doorway and returned back to their world once again. And so they found themselves back on the train platform in the Earth year 1941. While Peter and Susan had been told by Aslan that their adventures in Narnia were through, Edmund had the suspicion that he would someday find his way back to Narnia once again. In the early summer of 1942, Edmund, along with his sister Lucy, was sent to spend his summer holiday at his cousin Eustace's house. Edmund and Lucy would often spend their time in an upstairs room reminiscing about Narnia, despite the teasing from Eustace. It was during one of these times that a painting on the wall suddenly turned into a magical portal that brought all three children back to Narnia once again. The trio were transported into the middle of the Narnian Eastern Ocean, and it appears that Edmund must have spent his year at school improving his swimming technique, because during the last trip to Narnia, he could hardly swim at all. After a brief time in the water, they were rescued by the great ship Don Treader, which was, coincidentally, sailed by King Caspian and his crew, including Reepicheep, Captain Drinian, and his first mate, Rince. They were on a mission to discover the fate of the seven lost lords of Narnia. 
Edmund and the other children joined Caspian for the entirety of the voyage and explored many new islands along the way. There were the Lone Islands where Edmund and the others were kidnapped by slave traders and eventually rescued by Caspian. Then there was Dragon Island, where Edmund and Lucy discovered that the dragon of the island was actually the transfigured Eustace. After visiting a small island they named Burnt Island, and then barely surviving a harrowing attack by the legendary Great Sea Serpent, Edmund and the others explored a new island which would later become known as Deathwater Island. It was here that Edmund saved the life of the landing party by discovering that the waters of the magical pool were actually very deadly because whatever touched the water turned to solid gold. Edmund and the crew next landed on what would become known as the Island of the Duffers, where they were held captive by invisible dwarves until Lucy agreed to recite a magic spell to make them visible once again. Edmund and the crew set sail from the Magician's Island and not long after came across what first appeared to be a black mountain rising out of the sea. Very soon, they realized it was actually a great wall of smooth, solid blackness, which would later be known as Dark Island. When the crew foolishly sailed into the darkness, they suddenly found themselves hopelessly lost and plunged into a world where dreams and nightmares could come true. When it seemed there was no escape to be found, Aslan sent a white albatross to guide the ship to safety, speaking only the words, courage, dear heart, and sending them safely back along their journey. After several more days, Edmund and the rest of the crew spotted the last island they would visit on their voyage, the island of the star known as Ramandu's Island. There, Edmund and the others found the remaining three lost lords of Narnia, met the retired star Ramandu, and his daughter, who would one day become Caspian's wife. And finally, they feasted from Aslan's table. Now the following day, Edmund set out with Caspian, Lucy, and Eustace, and Reepicheep to the edge of the world and the entrance to Aslan's country. They sailed across the kingdom of the Mer people, through the lily-colored waters of the Silver Sea, and finally ran aground at the edge of the world. Edmund and the others bid farewell to their dear friend Reepicheep as he sailed his tiny coracle over the great standing wave and into Aslan's country. After Reepicheep left them, the party exited their boat and waded along the shore. And it was in that moment that Aslan told Lucy and Edmund that their time in Narnia had come to an end. And then, Edmund was back in the bedroom of Aunt Alberta's home in Cambridge. For the next seven years, Edmund lived a fairly normal life, going to school and coming home for the holidays. In 1949, he reunited with the Seven Friends of Narnia, as they called themselves, and they gathered to reminisce about their days in Narnia. While they were together, they witnessed a ghostly vision of Prince Tyrion, who appeared in obvious distress before he vanished completely from sight. Convinced that it was a sign they were needed in Narnia, the group devised a plan to retrieve the magic rings that had been buried in Diggory's backyard so long ago and used them to send Eustace and Jill back to Narnia. Edmund and Peter, disguised as construction workers, were able to successfully retrieve the rings and took them immediately to the train station, where they would meet the others. As the train came into view at the station, Edmund noticed that it seemed to be going around the bend a bit too fast. But by then, it was too late. Edmund, Peter, along with the other friends of Narnia and the Pevensey parents were all killed in a tragic train accident. And so, in 1949, at the age of 19 years old, Edmund Pevensey's life on Earth came to an end. But that's not the end of the story of Edmund Pevensey. You see, after Aslan called down the stars and closed up Narnia, King Edmund and the other seven friends of Narnia were watching from just beyond the stable door, watching from Aslan's country the true and greater Narnia, where they would never have to leave again. For as Aslan put it, the term is over, the holidays have begun, the dream has ended, this is the morning. And that's just the beginning of the story of King Edmund Pevensey the Just. Because as we all know, once a king of Narnia, always a king of Narnia.